I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today we're in the New Testament book of 2 Thessalonians. You know, just because Paul visited a city and preached the gospel for an extended period of time, or even founded a church, those things in and of themselves did not protect the new church from self-serving heretics. In fact, the immaturity of any new church presents a perfect target for spiritual predators who mislead and distort the truth. And Paul was continually concerned to the point of worry about his friends in Thessalonica and their troubles with false teachers. In Thessalonica, the new believers were being deliberately misled, even to the point of false teachers forging letters to make them look as if Paul had written them. And so Paul took extra care in this letter to make sure that the Thessalonians understood not only his authoritative views on the scripture and the end times, but also to make them aware of what his handwriting looked like. This is so that they would be able to authenticate his letters through handwriting analysis. Welcome to CSI New Testament. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Whenever society becomes so focused on the fleeting glory of worldly and material stuff, Well, its people then forget the eternal glory and the heavenly and spiritual things, the stuff that should direct their lives, discipline, self-control. And these are the foundation to Christian living. Those become the enemy in a postmodern culture. Uh, It's the feels-good-do-it culture. It's not just an early church dilemma, by the way. People today descend into an unruly and lazy existence that possesses little care for other people. And this careless condition is then amplified whenever our personal comfort is disrupted by our having to serve other people, or if we feel like we're not being served enough by the church. Well, how do you cope with the conflict which exists between the flesh's desire for constant comfort and God's desire for you to selflessly serve others. Paul addresses all of that in this epistle. So with all of that said, I believe we're going to benefit greater from reading all three chapters of 2 Thessalonians. Uh, So there's so much here that we just need to be reminded of all of it in context. So let's begin 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Believe me, it's going to be fun. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, begins this way. Paul, Silvanus, which was a word for Silas, that's probably his former name. His mom called him Silvanus when she was mad at him. <laughs> Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brothers as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Let's stop here for a moment. Your patience and your faith in persecution. Consider James chapter 1 verses 2 through 5. He says this, he says, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let's continue reading here in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 5. He says this, uh, as he's saying, so that, uh, let me read in 4 and then we'll roll into 5. He says, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all of your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. God's righteous judgment. We tend to think of God's judgment, especially his righteous judgment, as a negative thing, as in, I don't want to be on the bad side of God's righteous judgment. Well, what about being on the good side of it, right? Because we only think of God's judgment in terms of punishing and judging sin. But God also judges faith. And, uh, 
and so that we can know the extent of our faith as well as our unrealized potential to act even more faithfully. So sometimes in his best judgment that God will put us through a trial, a difficulty in order to reveal the extent of our faith to us and also to any onlookers who need to see a faithful Christian going through hardship. That's the only way that you know that the faith will work. They need to see you going through hardship, and then, and then while you're enduring it, you endure it with grace and with faithful hope. You know, sometimes God reveals faithfulness. Sometimes He reveals faithlessness to those who boast about being faithful. Other times, He reveals your faith to you. You don't feel like you're very faithful, but then He puts you through a trial to reveal to you you're a lot more faithful than you thought you were. But nevertheless, God knows in His righteous judgment how to grow us. And by the way, he doesn't just grow us by keeping us from suffering. Suffering or hardship is even a function of God's grace to his children. Consider Philippians chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. Here's what Paul said to the church in Philippi. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. He's saying the grace of God is is not just your salvation, but also your suffering, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now you hear is in me. Isn't that interesting? Well, what was the conflict that they saw in Paul there in the streets of Philippi? Uh, he's getting beat up. People are yelling at him all the time. He's getting drugged into false trials. He's getting thrown into prison. As a matter of fact, he says, uh, having the same conflict that you saw in me and now here is in me, He's writing to them from a jail in another town, and he's not saying, hey, if you follow God rightly, you won't have to suffer like I do. He says, if you follow God rightly, just know that you will suffer like I do, but look at what's happened. Every time I get thrown into a prison, it becomes a church because revival breaks out. He says in verse uh, 5, he says, it's manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you might be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. The kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Just as someone else's suffering and selflessness accompanied the gospel and then led to our salvation, well, then we too are called to advance the kingdom in the same way. Try as you like, you cannot engineer suffering out of the Christian experience. And because the kingdom of which we are citizens, and now on behalf of which we should be advancing, because uh, it is itself countercultural, well, then an enemy, the devil, the flesh, and all of the worldly support systems are against it. Just know it's going to happen. But your suffering is not without reason. And it is with utmost urgency and importance that we should be advancing the gospel, this kingdom of which we have been granted worthy to suffer. Let's keep reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Verse 6 says this, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When should I expect that rest which is coming? Well, I hope it comes soon, but the truth is for some people, it won't come until it is an eternal rest. But think about it. It will be an eternal rest, a rest that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. He says in verse 8, he says when he comes... When, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes, it means that he not, not that he might come, no, when he comes, he says, when he comes in that day, to, the, uh, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony of you was believed. Don't you love that? Our testimony to you, God is going to repay people who trouble you 
You don't have to do it yourself. Check out Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He says, Dearly beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He says, You're going to get rest when Jesus is revealed in heaven with his angels. You know, we will receive this rest from those who persecute us when the revelation of Jesus comes. And one of two things will occur. Number one, we share the gospel with people whom are persecuting us, all right? And hopefully they'll see their need for salvation and repent and become believers. When they become believers, they should stop persecuting us. This is how you can stop persecution through spreading the gospel. Or number two, when Jesus is revealed in the final judgment, and we believers enter into his rest, then non-believers who were trying to live a life of rest, they were working very hard at their rest, by the way, well, then non-believers will enter into not an eternal rest, but eternal judgment. Now, you look at the two of those ends, eternal rest or eternal judgment, and you say, is the suffering in this life, is hardship in this life worth it? It sure is, but you have to bet the long game by the way, it's not a bet, it's a sure thing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 continues in this way. He says, therefore, this has all been leading up to this. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. We pray that God may count you worthy. Paul is not saying that God would count you worthy of salvation because you suffer. We're not considered worthy for salvation by anything other than Jesus' suffering on the cross. So what is Paul saying? Paul's saying that God, in his wisdom, allows us to suffer so that we can become a showman's sample for others to see how he can transform a life from being controlled by the flesh's insatiable desire for gratification to now being selfless and willing to suffer so that others can be saved. Wow, look how God can transform a life. You see, our suffering is a sign of our salvation and God's willingness to use us in order to build his kingdom. He says here again in verse 11, he says to fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. You know, we must never forget the fact that our ministry efforts are not our own or for our glory. They should be led by the Lord and empowered by his Holy Spirit in order to accomplish his will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 12, let's continue reading. He says, uh, let's just start in verse 11 and roll into 12. Therefore, we pray always for you so that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that in the name of our Lord Jesus, Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in you and you in him according to God's grace. Now consider that through the lens of John chapter 17, verses 15 through 23. This is Jesus praying to the Father before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's betrayed, and of course before he goes to the cross. This is what Jesus prayed. He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. What does that mean? Set them apart by your truth. That's why we're reading the Bible every day. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify or set apart myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me. That is, he's praying for you and me through their word, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, 
that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe, there's the end game, when they see the showman sample, they see what I can do to transform a life, and not only one, but a collection of them, growing collection, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Once again, that's John 17, verse 15 through 23. You see, the intimate nature of our growing personal relationship with God through a saving relationship with Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, well, that is so that we can experience that closeness with God. But just as important as the personal benefits of salvation is that God wants for us to be examples of how He can transform sinners into fully devoted followers, spiritual leaders who are not only disciples, but they can also lead others into discipleship. Let's continue reading in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, verse, uh, 2 Thessalonians Verse 1, he says, Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it is from us, as though the day of Christ has already come. So, as though the day of Christ has already come. Hey, don't be troubled by these guys who say that we've been saying this stuff, right? As I mentioned earlier, false teachers were determined to undermine Paul's teaching by deceiving the people. To what extent? To the extent of forging letters that supported their false claims. Oh, Paul says this. Look, as a matter of fact, I have a letter from Paul saying exactly what I just said, and the ink is still drying right? They're saying that these letters are sent by Paul. They even claim to speak by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it was not the Holy Spirit that was teaching. might have been a spirit, but the Holy Spirit was not accompanying the false teaching. Their main message was that Jesus had already returned. The resurrection has already happened, and he's even come back, and there was not going to be a second coming. The resurrection was the second coming. That was their argument. It's not true, but that's what they were saying, and they were saying, Paul agrees with us. Uh, there, there had been a rapture, they said, and I'm sorry, but you guys have missed out on it. Or it didn't really apply to you guys. By the way, it must not have applied to them either, because there they were saying it. You know, even in the church today, there's some people that wrongly teach. It's a heresy. And thus many have wrongly believed that the book of the Revelation is not speaking of future events. Right? They have the same spirit of the false teachers who were in 2 Thessalonians, sitting right there in Thessalonica. Yeah, they say, yeah, the revelation was, isn't talking about future events, which will happen in the end time. Rather, these false teachers of today's church era put forth that the book of the Revelation was solely concerning the events surrounding the Roman Empire in the era of the early church. Thus, They say that it cannot be relied upon to predict events which are yet to come. And those who believe otherwise, well, in their minds, you're just foolish and ignorant. And to those people, I ask the obvious questions. Okay, well then, if that's true, has Jesus returned? Has his church been raptured? Are you saying that this generation that we're living in now is heaven? Absolutely not. We continue reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. By the way, we're seeing that in our generation. Unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4. He says, who opposes and exalts himself above everything that is called God or worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, showing himself, telling everybody, hey, I'm God. 
Interesting. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse four, right? That day will come, right? I'm sorry, that day will not come unless the man of sin is revealed and then he'll sit in the temple claiming to be God, a.k.a. the Antichrist. Now check out what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16. He said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, well, there's a, there's a GPS, we'll go there in a moment. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, right? Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16. And now let's look at Daniel chapter 8. Jesus says, hey man, when you see the signs that Daniel was talking about, well, let's go there. Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Daniel prophesying of the future, one to come to the temple, declare himself to be God. He says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. And he shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Seal up, therefore, the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and I went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. You know, in the short term, this prophecy referred to a Greek king named Antiochus. Uh, and, he, and that whole story set up the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. But Jesus said that it is f uh, more far-reaching, and it has a more far-reaching component uh, to Daniel's prophet, prophecy, which is yet to be fulfilled. And so we are still awaiting the events surrounding the rise of Antichrist. And then that will trigger the rapture of the church at the coming tribulation and the day of the Lord. And that was Paul's point completely. Even as far late as Paul's ministry, the Antichrist had yet to emerge, much less the second coming and the judgment. We continue reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, uh, let's start uh, chapter 2 verse uh, 5. He says, do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Verse 6, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. You know, I told you all this before, and now you know what is restraining, like what's holding all of this back. Paul is reminding the believers and us by default to not stray from his instruction, which was from the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. It is the Holy Spirit who is restraining all-out worldwide anarchy and the likes of which the world has never known. He says well, he will be revealed in his own time. Consider Peter chapter 3 verse 9 speaking of those days approaching. He says this, The Lord is not slow concerning his promise. What does he mean? His promise both to save, his promise to return, and his promise to judge to the uttermost. He's not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. You say, what is God's will for me? His will is that you would turn from your sin, surrender control, and be saved. That's what he wills. But there's coming a point when his grace and his mer mercy will be retracted and then judgment will come. There's coming a day and he's giving ample time for people to turn from their sin. But there comes a day where he'll pull grace and mercy back 
and make way for his judgment to come or else he's not holy. And by the way, he is holy. And that's exactly what Peter was reminding the people of. Don't take God for granted. Don't think he's all like a big grandfather who's never going to punish you. No, there comes a point where you're going to see a judgment to come, which will make the flood of Noah and the fire and brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah look like warm-up acts for the main event. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 continues this way. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath uh, of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, Verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken away. What does that mean? It means God the judge will take Someday, that someday, he will remove God the Holy Spirit. He will take him who restrains away. Someday, God will say, Holy Spirit, we're done holding back the evil. Now they're going to see what they have stored up for themselves. Verse 8, he says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The lawlessness one, the lawless one will be revealed. And when he says lawless, what he means is those who live, not, not, not those who don't live according to the constitution of any particular nation, right? He, when he says lawlessness, he means those who live without the word of God. Those who are not uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and then seeking the word of the Lord so that they can be taught by the Holy Spirit to live according to it. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world today and has been for longer than we could imagine. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 continues in this way. He says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. All so-called theology, including long-held church traditions that are not according to God's Word, all of that has its origin in Satan because it knocks itself off of the truth of God's Word. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They didn't receive that they might be saved. Consider what the Bible says in John 3, 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You know, you don't go to hell because you reject Jesus. You go to hell because you don't receive him. And what do I mean by that? That means that everyone is bound for eternal judgment. We are born into sin. But look at what it says in John 2, uh, John 1 verse 12. It says, but as many as received him. How many? As many. As many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. God's desire is not that men would go to hell, that they would be judged and go to hell. His desire is that they would turn from their sin and receive salvation and spend eternity with Him. But you have a choice to make. We read John 3.18 speaking of, hey, you're not condemned if you've received Him, but if you don't receive Him, well, you're condemned already. But that begins with John 3, 16. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 17, for he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Everyone has the capacity to be saved, but you have to be willing to turn from the lies of this world and believe the testimony of the Holy Spirit concerning the truth of the gospel and your absolute, utter, urgent need for it and to surrender to it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12 continues in this way. He says in verse 11, And for this reason God will send them a strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they, may, uh, that they all may be con uh, condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They heard the gospel, but they took pleasure in rejecting it. He says, for this, God will send a strong delusion. This sounds as if God doesn't want some people to believe, and so he's going to send them a strong delusion. That's not what that means, right? Uh, it's not like he doesn't want some people to believe, but he wants others to believe. I know there's some people who believe that. And what's funny is nobody who actually believes that <clears throat> is an unbeliever. <laughs> Nothing can be further from the truth, by the way. But the qualifying statement is, for this, that is, he will send a strong delusion for this. God is not arbitrarily sending delusions so that people have no ability to receive the gospel. I mean, otherwise, why would he die for their sin? So what Paul is saying is that because some people choose to believe the false gospel of Satan, and they reject the testimony of the Holy Spirit concerning Jesus is the only way, well, then, uh, then they come to believe the lie is the truth, and then the truth is a lie. And unless they turn from the delusion, then God will always be a delusion to them. <clears throat> unless they turn from the delusion, well, then they could never receive salvation. Here's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Mark chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. What does that mean? Well, you know, the Holy Spirit only has one ministry, and that is to reveal the truth, the truth concerning God's holiness and Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. He reveals the only way of salvation. And so whenever you say that what he reveals is a lie, that's blaspheming. That just says, oh, what you're telling, which is the truth, that's a lie. The only thing he's revealing to you is the only form of forgiveness which is offered. So to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness because the only thing that he's trying to say to you is that forgiveness is offered. Do you understand? Therefore, for this reason, whenever the gospel is preached, those who have determined to reject the gospel, well, then God, in his offer of salvation by grace through faith, well, they are received by those people as if they are a strong delusion. Jesus, again, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In fact, the gospel is the only source of salvation and it is available to anyone who would believe and receive it. Regardless of the number of times they had rejected the gospel, even up to the point of their death, and I don't, I don't suggest that you do that, wait until the very end, try to get in on the cheap, because the question is, is that really saving faith? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, uh, brothers, <clears throat> Uh, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit in the truth. Let's go here for a moment. He says, from the beginning, God chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Again, this is not saying <clears throat> that God chose you from the beginning as in he chose you personally, and then he didn't choose other people. 
as if to say he doesn't choose others in the world. Anyone can be saved. <clears throat> and in Acts chapter 17, Paul tells uh, the people at Mars Hill that God is calling all men everywhere to repent. That means that all men everywhere have the capacity to believe and have the capacity to repent. Paul is saying that from the beginning, <clears throat> God chose for the outworking of Jesus' death on the cross, as evidenced by his resurrection, that the outworking of Jesus' sacrifice to be that whoever believes in the truth of the gospel will receive salvation, and the Holy Spirit will sanctify them, set them apart, as belonging to God. Once again, let's read it. Verse 13, <clears throat> But we are bound to give thanks to God for you always, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning, take the you out of it, chose you for salvation. What he chose for you <clears throat> is that you would be saved through Jesus and that the Holy Spirit would reveal that way to you so that perhaps you would turn from your sin and be saved. He says, God chose from the beginning, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit and belief in the truth. God does not give you the belief. God gives you the opportunity to believe and he to believe. And by the Holy Spirit, he gives you the truth so that you would surrender. Verse 14, <clears throat> he says, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He called you by our gospel. Romans 10 verses 14 and 15 says this, How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Here's our job. And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. Or how about Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Do you see the process? The gospel is preached, and then you have a choice to believe, to surrender to it or fight against it. And if you, and if you believe, well, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the process. You're not filled with the Holy Spirit and regenerated so that you will believe. That's kind of like Nancy Pelosi theology, right? Hey, we can't read the bill until we pass the bill, so we have to pass the bill in order to read what's in the bill. That's not the way it works right? That's not the way any good thing works. No, the gospel is preached. You have a choice to believe. The Holy Spirit has convincingly told you, and you're either going to listen to the Holy Spirit and surrender, or you're going to listen to your flesh, and you're going to retreat from it. But those who believe, then they are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible says, and He is our guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of His glory. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15 says this. He says, Therefore, brothers, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. The traditions that you were taught by the word, that is the Bible, or epistle by our instruction, which is inspired by the Lord. We're reading that instruction now, and it is Scripture itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says this, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, let's continue reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. He says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope of grace. He says in verse 17, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work. So, he's given us everlasting consolation and good hope. Remember Paul 
underwent great persecution. We've already talked about it. Yet his focus was not on living his best life now. He was focused on the goal of evangelism, the call of the Lord, the administration which he had been given to evangelize and to disciple. Hopefully, believing God's word that a heavenly rest awaited him. Is that your attitude? Because that is exactly the reason why Paul said, it's worth it to suffer now, because my best life is not now. My best life is later, and that later will be for all eternity. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, he says again, let it comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work. Now contrast that with how Satan sends the strong delusion. He promises hope, and yet he constantly defers it. Satan has no goodness in him. Hence, he has no desire to make good on his promises. Satan promises stuff all the time. Yeah, you get freedom. You get to li live the life. God will never let you leave, uh, lead. Uh, you get to be rich and famous. You get to be all these things. He doesn't want to do that. He just comes to lie, to kill, to destroy. Right? Most of us know Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. But it's his purpose and not our own. Now, on to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, which is actually kind of a salutation. Uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it was with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Not everyone has faith. What's he saying here? The Lord is faithful to establish, to guard, right? Consider Jesus' prayer again in John 17, verses 14 and 15. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. John 17, verses 14 through 15. We keep reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. He says, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and you will do the things that were commanded you. Check out Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When God works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure, he's not speaking of, of people before they're saved, right? Because there's some people who say God will come inside of you and then all of a sudden he'll, he'll, he'll give you the will to believe in Jesus. That's not even what this is talking about. He's speaking to believers. And he's like, man, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you stay in this word, which has been preached to you, well, then God who lives inside of you will, will start to change your desires and your will so that you will want to do what is his good pleasure and not focus always on yourself. He says in verse, uh, in verse 4, and he says, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you both that you will do and will to do the things that we command you. Verse 5, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ or of the Messiah. You know, God gave us uh, the gift of Jesus. He literally gave himself for us because of his love. And Jesus patiently awaits for as many as will come to come, not wanting any to perish. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, But we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. He's not talking about rabbinical traditions, which may or may not have been biblical. He's just saying, don't hang out with guys who walk away from the traditions which we have established, which are the word of the Lord. Not only that, withdraw from every brother who is disorderly. You know, don't let the fear of offending a believer who is deliberately sinning. 
Don't let that fear override your fear of the Lord and His command. Because God commands for us to persevere and to protect, to preserve the community from evil. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, uh, speaking of, um, uh, of uh, something that he had said in 1 Corinthians, or he said in an earlier letter, he said, uh, you know, I wrote you previously to not uh, keep company with those who are sexually immoral. And then he goes on to say, and, but I want to clarify, I'm not saying don't keep company with sexually immoral who aren't believers, right? Because number one, that is your mission to affect the world. But what I'm saying is, don't keep company with people who call themselves a brother and yet are openly sexually immoral. And, and oftentimes in the church, we get it the opposite. People want to never hang out with an unbeliever, but then they tolerate all kinds of godliness or godlessness from people who call themselves believers. Paul is underscoring this once again. Okay? Don't fear what believers might think of you, because they're going to say all kinds of stuff. Oh, you're judging me. You know, you're trying to take the speck out of my eye. You have a plank in your eye. Well, that same passage says that by their fruit, you will know them. And the purpose of, of, uh, the purpose of putting those people away from you is not to perpetually shun them, but so that they would feel the shame of their sin, and then they would perhaps repent and be restored, not only to Christian community, but be restored to the Lord, which is more important. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11 says this, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, and yet I certainly didn't mean sexually immoral people of this world, or the covetous, or the extortioners, or idolaters, since then you need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler, a drunkard or an extortioner. Don't even eat with such a person. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Well, let's continue reading 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. He says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow uh, us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil every night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We continue reading in verse 9, not because we didn't have the authority, uh, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, and we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Could you imagine politicians putting forth that legislation in the middle of our many welfare state that we live in? For we hear that there are some of you who walk among you disorderly, uh, not working at all, but they're busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Verse 14, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, take note of him, and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Like I said, Paul is not advocating passive-aggressive behavior. Do not cowardly avoid a brother or a sister who is sinning without telling them why you're avoiding them. Don't ghost them, as they say. Approach them in a godly manner. Is it uncomfortable? Of course it is. Is it, is it, might it lead to suffering? Of course it will. But you must confront that person and take a fellow believer with you if they consistently refuse accountability. And finally, along with the church leadership, let that person know why you will all be avoiding them. And they simply cannot abuse godly community by seeking the benefits of the community without being accountable to God's word on which the community is built. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 15. He says this, And you, I'm sorry, yet do not count this person as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Because there's some people that are like, man, how judgmental is that, Steve? that you would put somebody out, you know, like they're your enemy now. And so, no, he says, don't, don't count them as an enemy. Admonish them as a brother. 
This is a thing which is lost in our culture to be, to be honest and, and to be open and to be accountable to one another and to be held accountable. You see, the goal of such harsh measures is restoration. It's not just to put them out forever. God wants people to be restored. And, 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 and because if you put them out forever, then there's no hope of forgiveness and then there's no hope of reparation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17 ends in this way. Well, let's start with 16. He says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace, always and in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the sign of every epistle that I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He says, I'm writing this with my own hand. Paul wanted the people to learn his handwriting so that they could spot forgeries in his letters. And I love that. The grace of Jesus be with you all. You know, the goal of the gospel, you have, uh, you have grace which is offered to you. We were formerly enemies of the Lord, whether you knew it or not, because the Bible says that friendliness with the world is enmity, which means warfare against God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be his enemy because he is a holy God. And yet in his holiness, he has offered to us a way of salvation. When he himself, through the person of Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for our sin so that we wouldn't have to pay it. He rose from the grave, proving evidence that he had defeated sin and death. And he's alive now, offering to you eternal life if you would turn from your sin and receive it. And you know what? If you've never turned from your sin, if you've never received the grace of Jesus Christ, and you would know if you were, because you'd be filled with His Holy Spirit, well, then you could place your faith and your trust in Jesus even now. You say, I don't know, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Well, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And the right time to do the right thing is always right now. And I can lead you in a prayer where you could do that very thing. You can speak to God yourself. If you believe these things in your heart and you will confess them with your mouth, the Bible says you shall be saved. Let's pray. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And I know that you're perfect and holy and I fall short. But I believe that Jesus, God made flesh, died for my sin on the cross. I believe that he rose from the grave, proving that he has defeated death and that he has defeated sin and I believe that he offers me eternal life and forgiveness of all my sin if I would turn from my sin now and receive it. So, Lord, I'm turning from my sin. I don't want to be who I've been. I want to be who you designed me to be, even in my mother's womb. Lord, I surrender control. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Take control of my life and begin to teach me how to live a life of faithfulness and thankfulness because of what you have done for me. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul said, I believe that you are able to keep what I have committed to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'd love to hear from you. And you can contact us at groundworksministries.com. Groundworksministries.com. And we'll help you on your journey with the Lord. And by the way, here we are reading the Bible day by day and chapter by chapter. So tomorrow, Timothy, the, the epistle of Timothy, chapter one. I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Check us out at groundworksministries.com. Groundworks Ministries.